Now, are you ready? Ready, Freddie. Okay. I'm Gina Baxter. And I'm Rafael Morales. And this is Fire Fire on on the the Mountain. Mountain. On this week's episode, we discuss a new affordable housing project approved by the city of Hendersonville, as well as a recap of our 2022 primary election. Our guests this week are Kurt and Jan Darnell, owners of Kingmaker's Draft, a tap house and gaming parlor on Main Street in Hendersonville. And without any further ado, let's let's light it up. up. Is that good? The city of Hendersonville is going to see a development of 80 units of desperately needed, potentially actually affordable housing on Sugarloaf Road if the Housing Assistance Corporation completes the plan that won city council approval on Thursday night. They want to build 60 apartments and 20 single-family homes on 19 acres in the Apple Ridge development between Sugarloaf Road and East Prince Road. HAC, the affordable housing nonprofit agency that has built 370 apartments and 200 single-family homes in the past 34 years, had to have the area rezoned in order to allow the project. The rent for one, two, and three-bedroom apartments would range from $422 to $1,172, including utilities, depending on size of the units. Homeowners would help HAC construction crews build the houses through the agency's self-help program. The homes would be 1,100 to 1,200 square feet and cost $229,000, including the lot cost, which is less than half the cost of a new home in the private market, HAC Executive Director Ashlyn McCoy said. The general sweat equity of the self-help program that Housing Assistance asks for is 65% of the labor at 10 hours per week. Sweat equity was popularized by Habitat for Humanity, so imagine those types of projects. Framing, building trusses, hammering, and eventually getting to choose some of the interior components of the home. The Apple Ridge development is one of three projects seeking tax credit financing approval from the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency. Also vying for the housing agency support are the 78-unit White Pine Villas Senior Housing Development at 2620 Chimney Rock Road and the proposed 60-unit Hawkins Point Development at 714 6th Avenue West. Council Member Jennifer Hensley asked that the City Council send a letter to the Housing Finance Agency in support, and Mayor Barbara Volk directed the staff to draft a letter to the agency endorsing the project. I feel like four hundred and forty two dollars is legitimately affordable. It's it's deeply affordable. Yeah. Um on, on the carry campaign we did some number crunching on like, you know, mean household income and what should be affordable. And we arrived at aff- affordable housing if if it was gonna be like a third of your income should be about six hundred and sixty dollars a month. Yeah. So that's deeply affordable. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. How cool would it be to have housing that not only is within people's means, but gives them a cushion to give money back to their community. Yeah. Be amazing. That's the whole point of affordable housing. Is this nature healing herself? Is that what's happening? (laughs) I don't know if we're there yet. No. (laughs) We had a housing panel at work for our clients and Ashlyn McCoy was there and she was talking about the sweat equity thing. Mm -hmm. And we also had someone from Habitat there and they were saying, I didn't realize this, but when they build developments, everybody in the neighborhood of the new development helps each other build Mm -hmm. their houses. Yeah. And for one of them, I think it's for housing assistance, you can move in as your house is ready. But for Habitat, you have to wait till the whole neighborhood's done. So you're motivated to like help your neighbors and you get to know each other. And we had a parent on the panel who said, you know, I know all my neighbors because we all helped each other create our homes together fucking communists <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah building community how dare you so um <laughs> so speaking of communism um, sherry beasley won the candidacy for u.s senate for democrats in the primary she won in every single county in north carolina that's insane i know i can't even wrap my mind around that <laughs> still know. still that what an exciting night primary was yeah, there was so much happening, y'all. There, there was there was a lot of fascinating races that last uh, last Tuesday. Yeah, um, it was a fascinating night, and it was also um, it was a little bit 
heartbreaking. I I mean, I think everybody who listens by now knows that we love Jay Carey. And uh, I'm bummed that he didn't make it. Not only because I love him and I think he's great, but because he was easily the best fit. Yeah. But we got to roll with it and we're gonna. So yep. Sherry Beasley crushed it. <laughs> um, watching those results pull, pour in it's was insane. phenomenal. I mean, every single county. There was one, I think Iredell County was the last one to report. And I was like, oh man, she got every single county, but the last one. And then she got it too. Mm. Has that ever happened before? I have no idea. I'm sure that it has now that I say it, but I'm sure she was thrilled. Well, I, can, I can imagine, yeah. And it felt very last minute. Like I had people calling and texting me the day of the primary being like, what do for Senate? Yeah. Because we didn't, you know, we didn't y- talk about it. They're not from yeah, here. Same. Also felt really nice to see Pat McCrory get just his ass beat. Yes. Yeah. And everybody was like, nope, move along. Like nobody yeah. gave him the time of day. He didn't get any media coverage. It was like a flash in the pan. Finally. Yeah. Remember when he came to the Apple Festival and everybody like threw stuff at him? <laughs> I do not remember this. (laughs) I don't. No, I don't. I don't remember that. Rachel Austin. (laughs) (laughs) We're gonna find out who listens to this podcast. Name dropping. So Sherry Beasley's a mom, former public defender, judge, and also the first black woman to serve as chief justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Her site also says that she, quote, spent her life fighting to uphold the law and keep communities safe. And as a U.S. senator, she'll fight to lower costs, create good paying jobs and expand access to affordable quality health care in every part of North Carolina. She'll be running against Ted Budd, who right now has the support of 47 percent of registered voters in the poll, while 39 percent of registered voters back Beasley. So an 8 percent difference. Um, and another 12% remain undecided, which is a good sign for us. It's a sign that their standings could fluctuate and that there's a little bit of room on either side. So the percentage of undecided voters outweighs the difference between the two of them, which is a good thing. They are vying for Richard Burr's seat to represent North Carolina alongside Tom Tillis, who had a huge hand in ousting Cawthorn with his super PAC results NC, um, which sent out like 90,000 mailers and had all kinds of ads. And um, he really put the work into getting Cawthorn out of there. Yeah. And uh, our friend and ally Jay Carey conceded to Jasmine Beach Ferrara with Katie Dean finishing the race between the two of them. The biggest news of the night, of course, was that Madison Cawthorn... Lo- I just caught that I am again the one talking about Madison Cot. I don't know how it happens. It just it just happens. <laughs> okay. The biggest news of the night, of course, was that Madison Cawthorn lost his primary to Chuck Edwards. Edwards also came up in Henderson County, but he was born in Waynesville. He's kind of flipped his political approach in recent years to make it more palatable to Trumpers. His website says that he wants to bring back the politics of the Trump era. He's been in the Senate since 2016. So what's next? We're so. supposed to band together around Jasmine Beach Ferrara unless we want Chuck representing us, right? That's that's the next thing that we do. Yeah, I guess that's the next thing we do. But unfortunately, uh, Jasmine Beach Ferrara has been the center of a lot of controversy, not the least of which is her voting record on Raytheon money coming into Asheville as a Buncombe County commissioner. Yeah, and to dive into that, we're going to have to go back to November of 2020 when Buncombe County commissioners unanimously voted to bring a giant Pratt and Whitney facility to Asheville, right on the east bank of the second oldest river on the planet, the French Broad, and behind the parkway. It's a 100-acre site that will require a new bridge to be built and a new interstate exchange. On top of the disruption to our land, Pratt and Whitney is owned by Raytheon, a defense corporation. The plant is already well in the works, with employees already at the site, which will produce airfoils or shaped surface, such as uh, an airplane wing, tail, or propeller blade that produces lift and drag when moved through the air. Eventually, Pratt & Whitney say it will lead to 800 jobs. Yeah, so um, we're saying here that Raytheon is a defense corporation, but we could probably go further and say that they're one of the top three defense corporations in the world. Um, they're huge and this is a huge thing. And Buncombe County 
voted unanimously to approve it and it's coming to fruition. Yeah, there's a lot there that um, there was the initial outrage, right? And then yep. like everything else, it just kind of waned, it kind of went away. Yep. Um, but y'all, in, in the manufacturing um, of airfoils, there is a lot, there's a lot of waste. Um, you know, actually, I'm going to leave this one. I'm just going to, I don't want to go down a tangent of, you know, I'm going to be critical of Jasmine Beach Ferrara, but I'm also going to do what I can to get her elected. Yeah, that's so, the hard part. Yeah, and and that's the thing is you, you have to choose who represents you best. And right. She does so. Definitely better than Chuck Edwards. Correct. And I'm I'm going to give her my vote, and I'm going to do what I can. Um, and in the meantime, I will just say for research, for all intents and purposes, folks at home listening, um, please please look into Pratt Whitney and uh, the Buncombe County Commission's decision. Uh, to have it built. Yeah. And even if it doesn't change your vote, which, you know, it's not, it's not changing ours, but it's still a good thing to be as aware as possible of what the people who represent us are really about. Right. So if it's money, it's good to know that. Chelsea Walsh, who uh, was in the Hendersonville city council race with me, lost her bid for a state house to Jennifer Balcom, whose own website describes her as a quote, proven conservative fighter, end quote and specifically mentions that she does not want CRT in our schools, which goes straight back to our conversation about Flat Rock Classical Academy and the charter schools and Bed with the Coach Brothers. She's been a mortgage banker for most of her professional career, but of course describes herself first as a white wife. <laughs> Freudian. <laughs> um... She's been a mortgage banker for most of her professional career, but of course describes herself first as a wife. Do you think that's too harsh? I think it's fucked up to say I'm a wife first. Like you're Does running for kids? office. Does she have kids? Yeah. She says she's a wife and mother, which I guess is like the way to pander to people. But like, it just seems so biblically based right. to me to identify as your spouse's spouse first and not like a person. Like you're married. Yeah. Congratulations. I don't care. Yeah. What's your husband like? There's, so while I can reserve the right to always be disgusted by the patriarchy. I understand that there's um, culture and I won't, I won't in conversation, you know, berate someone because they identify above all things as um, a wife or, you know, you see what I'm saying? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm not phrasing this correctly because I'm tired, but no, yeah. I do know what you mean that. Yeah. That people, and, and that's true. People are allowed to identify. However, they feel like whatever is important to them. But I think it's telling that the first thing that right, she yeah. wants you to know about her. I'm a wife. Yeah. 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 All right. Great job. Well, she far outspent Walsh and Justice during the primary with finance reports showing her campaign spent close to $24,000. Most of the expenses went toward advertising, including billboards, yard signs, newspaper ads, and radio. And Chelsea Walsh said that she and Jennifer Balcom were good friends before drifting apart as a result of the campaign, according to the Times News. Y'all, it is imperative that we turn out to vote for Michael Greer O'Shea who we did not vote for in the primary because he's running as an unopposed Democrat. Right. So if you're not familiar with his name yet, it's because he hasn't been on a ballot that you voted yet, but he will be on the ballot in November and he is the only Democrat running for this seat. And after our district's gerrymander, the uh, NC House 117th Congressional District is actually super winnable for a Democrat. I actually saw Chelsea Walsh at the polls um, when I was volunteering for Jay. Um, I, had, I had seen Jasmine as well, and Jasmine kept walking, and Chelsea came up and talked to me for a little bit. And Does Chelsea Jasmine know who you are? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Che so Chelsea Walsh is there, and she, she told me to my face that if she loses this race, there's a very high probability that the Democrats will take it. That it that we can actually send a Democrat to Raleigh for the first time in a very long time. Um, but more more interesting, I think, than a lot, uh, especially with the Chelsea Walsh and Jennifer Balcom race, was the hard pivot that Chelsea Walsh made after losing the Hendersonville City Council race. So like we had our election, mm -hmm. and within like two or three weeks, she she had lost, and then she announced that she was running for a higher office. Right. Um, her reasoning to me in person as to why she decided to do that was frankly pretty upsetting and disgusting. But she said that Hendersonville is too small minded for her and that she belongs in Raleigh. So that's where <laughs> she's going to fight to go. 
Um, Which is hilarious when her campaign slogan was Don't Asheville My Hendersonville. Exactly. I'm sorry. Also, Michael O'Shea <laughs> ran against Mo Davis in the Democratic primary for the 11th uh, U.S. congressional race. He was mm-hmm. like the true like Sanders candidate, um, whereas Mo Davis was the more hardy sort of like blue dog Democrat supported candidate um, for older generations. Michael O'Shea was also the only millennial in that race. Um, he, oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. And he, he talked a big game about, you know, UBI, universal basic income. Uh, he talked about raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, um, you know, supporting unions. I mean, it's the, it's the same. And it's not just that he's the only Democrat. I strongly support Michael O'Shea in all of his politics because he knows exactly what he's talking about. Um, he's well-studied. He's well-spoken. He's direct. He's personal. Um, he's not hyper-confrontational. Um, and he stands his ground and he knows that he's got some work to do here. He's got to roll up his sleeves and he's got a full year of campaigning to do. And at this point, we know that most of the people listening to this are going to vote for Jasmine no matter what. Um, but the real work that I think needs to be done is to send a Democrat to Raleigh and to do what we can for, for Michael. And, uh, he's agreed to come on the podcast. So we're going to have him here, um, in an episode or two. Hopefully I didn't we get, know that. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. so exciting. Hopefully we can get him and uh, Stephanie Justice as well, um, who is running for our state Senate seat. So, um, yeah, all exciting stuff. So now that um, we're moved past the primaries and towards the general, is this the point where, like, our local Democrats, like our local Democratic office will back Michael fully and, like, Help Michael, fund him. Michael will have the total and complete consolidated support of the Democratic Party in his district. Yes. <laughs> Such a relief. Okay. Yeah. And all Democrats that are in elected positions um, would not be out of their lane if they endorsed him publicly. Talking awesome. to you, Lindsay. <laughs> Wait, is she allowed to be... You can do whatever you want. You can endorse people. Yeah. It's, it's like frowned upon if you're in a, in a nonpartisan office like a city council, but she can absolutely do that. So can Debbie. Debbie vocally endorsed Jasmine. Oh, really? Yeah. She. I went to the Democratic uh, breakfast where mm-hmm. all the candidates were, and um, Debbie was there, and Jasmine was there. And Jasmine even said in her speech, you know, she's very, because she's in Hendersonville, she has to. She said that she was very proud to have, you know, received the endorsement and support of councilwoman debbie roundtree and you know people clapped and everything but oh wow yeah okay is Lindsay um like an out democrat yeah oh yeah okay yeah she was the only democrat i believe in in her primary she was the only one i think so too i just didn't know how like um oh yeah i i, I i've talked with her about what that experience was like being yeah. being the only democrat and what it was like and you know, working with the party and everything it was yeah she i'm telling you man democrats in our area it's if if you've got the skin and you've got the fight you're gonna do the thing you're you're gonna show up and you're gonna do it yeah but you got to know folks listening at home if you're thinking about running as a democrat in these races um we mentioned this in the last episode like they're going to fuck with you. Yeah. They're going to come so hard and the gloves are going to be off and it's going to be unlike anything you've ever experienced in the worst way. And, you know, you have to insulate yourself from a lot of that. Um, you have to love yourself, take care of yourself. Um, and have keep... other people open your messages sometimes. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't take it all in. Yeah. Let other people take some of the brunt of it. I would just totally shut down social media altogether and just allow someone else to do it for you. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break, and whenever we come back, we're going to speak with Kurt and Jan Darnell, owners of the Kingmaker's Draft on Main Street, right here in Hendersonville. It's a tap house and gaming parlor. This episode is brought to you by Oklawaha Brewing Company. Oklawaha Brewing is a nano brewery and taproom committed to brewing high quality beer in a vibrant atmosphere and is conveniently located in downtown Hendersonville. Drop in sometime and check it out. Oh, okay. I'll bring you down. I'll bring you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. 
What's that? Gina. Jan. Hey. I feel like I, we've met. We've definitely yeah, okay, done yeah, this, but like a while ago, like real yeah, fast. Yeah. I knew you were with him, so when I saw you, I was like, oh, yeah, they're friends. Um, so I've, I've been recording this whole time just for B-roll sounds or whatever. But, okay, cool. Um, so who are you? What do you do? Where are we? What's going on? Okay. What is this place? Okay. We're in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. Uh, no, uh, my name is Jan Darnell. I'm the owner of the Kingmaker's Draft. It's a board game bar here in Hendersonville. Uh, and it's awesome. Everybody come. Please come. Give me mm-hmm. all your money. <laughs> I play D&D here. Uh, almost every Tuesday night. Yes, that's yeah. awesome. We definitely and have a place for that. Um, hey, Kurt, we need you here. And I'm going to go play games now. What is the game? So that... I am about to leave and go play a game called Werewolf. Uh, it's a game of deceit. Um, uh, someone's the werewolf, but no one knows who, and everybody's trying to figure it out, and the werewolf is trying to hide. So, so, so it's like I Mafia. Think. Yes. Yes. Yeah. How exactly. often do you play that? Um, this is actually my first time playing it, but uh, the one of my employees, Blake, has been telling me that this is something we can play uh, bar wide. So we're kind of doing it, kind of like our version of a trivia night is werewolves. So. Yeah. So we're gonna do that. I'm gonna go roll and do that. Cool. Right. <laughs> so Wednesdays at six. Wednesdays at six. Thirty. No, probably six. It going? It's going? Uh, who who oh, are you? Fun. Who are you? What do you do? Where... I'm uh, Kurt Darnell, and uh, I... What do I do here? I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> usually stand behind the door and uh, hope some peeps come in, but yeah. aside from that, I turn into a kitchen goblin and sort of retreat back there and make food. Yeah. <laughs> you transform. I do, yeah. Or the transformation is more coming out here. Right, that's usually, just your true self, yeah. the kitchen goblin. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So we are in Kingmaker's Draft yes. on the corner of First Avenue and Main Street, which is right up from West First and right beside, uh, is this? What's I got Brandy's right here. Brandy's, yep. Brandy's, okay. And we now have Tamron Peacock Architects right above us. So. Oh, oh yeah. she was across, she was yeah, across yeah, and then the they fire. Had the, they had the fire, which we're trying to bring into the lore of all our werewolf stuff going on here. We'll figure something out. Yeah. Oh. Mm. So I just uh, I just got this this drink and it looks delicious. It's got um, it's got a, a mint yes mint leaf in it and it's uh, color is that like blood orange looking? Yeah, it's like a coral to blood orange. It's like a deep rich pink color. Yeah. It's very pretty. Mm. It's so sweet and so succulent. And what is it? Oh, so it is a uh, it's a sake take essentially on the uh, south side, which itself I guess is the gin take on a mojito. And um, so yeah, we just uh, since we don't have a liquor license, decided to start making cocktails with sake. And yeah, uh, just figuring out what works with the flavor of it, how it blends in well, and uh, for the most part, it's turned into a really good uh, gin substitute. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you don't have. A liquor license, but what all do you sell here? We got uh, beer, draft beer, and most of the time it is going to be local. Everything up there currently is. Western North Carolina, going out to maybe the Charlotte area a lot of the time, and uh, with very rare exceptions. Then we get uh, a few cans and such, um, more of the Sierra Nevada, just easy drinking, something that people can easily identify with. Uh, the wine, which is uh, my typical go to, is. Um, you know, a selection of reds, whites uh, that I do the tastings for and pick out for peeps. And uh, then, of course, the weird sake cocktails, which, uh, <laughs> which are different, but uh, have actually uh, ended up getting a lot of interest lately. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a pretty innovative way to tackle the no liquor license bit, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, we, we wanted have... to offer up some interesting mixed drinks to people, but... Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a journey on how to do that. Yeah. 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 So, um, food menu. The food menu. Oh. We've got uh, hummus plate, a big ass pretzel, chips and salsa. What's the KMD club? Oh, it's just a club sandwich. Um, uh, the way I usually make it, uh, good oil and vinegar on the bottom with uh, some basil thrown in there because, or oregano. I'm sorry. Uh, and um, yeah, just a just a club. KMD is uh, Kingmaker's Wrap, so that's our course, that's our weird uh, yeah abbreviation that we do. <laughs> and then um, yeah, then we have the uh, apple and ham bernini, which is just a panini with some uh, melted brie on it. 
apple coating of apple butter and uh, just comes through with, as a really sweet sort of ham sandwich. And then uh, our pita dia sandwich and our nachos, which are um, just steaks on quesadilla nachos here. Uh, we pickle the, the onions in house. We try to do as much in house as possible if I want to make kitchen. So, cool. Yeah. Um, so for folks that don't know, Kingmaker's Draft. Um, where did the name come from, and what exactly is like the the model here? Like, what type of uh, oh, yeah. establishment are we in? So, um, it's a board game parlor. Uh, I guess it depends on who we're marketing to. Uh, other times we call it a cafe, sometimes a bar. Um, <laughs> so, but parlor is what I generally think of it as. And um, we got about 400 board games in the back that anyone can come in and set on the table. Uh, we don't have any cover charge at the moment for those games, uh, or, or table charge or anything like that. Um, uh, it may be in the future that we have to implement it, depending on how table turnover is going and that sort of thing. Um, but for the time being, it's uh, just easy to grab one. We uh, offer up, of course, the food and drink menu, um, and really that's where any of the revenue would come from. And uh, the name came uh, from board game terms. So Kingmaker is uh, going to be a person that can dictate the uh, the winner of a game, um, but can't win themselves. So typically you have a score off between two people, and uh, whatever this player does will impact uh, whoever wins that game. And draft, of course, goes for beer, card drafting, um, Geez, lots of different types of drafting. I probably shouldn't get no list anymore. But yeah. You can if you want. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I, I, you see Green Man and Brevard. Oh, no, and... I was going to talk about the board game side. But I oh, don't, oh. To talk about <laughs> I don't know what That's the board game side is, though. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, a card draft is, um, or a draft, uh, and a card draft being the most typical form, is going to be when everyone has a hand of cards, you pick one card to keep for yourself and pass that uh, your hand on to the next person. Okay. And you'll get the ne- uh, like the person to your right. Yeah. Or something like okay. That. Yeah. And um, it's sort of a way of mitigating um, the luck factor in games. So yeah. you know, I deal you out five cards. I deal you with five off or five cards. Um, your five might be the best in the game, while your five might be complete trash, and uh, that immediately. It tends to unbalance uh, what might otherwise be a very enjoyable game. So yes. drafting can be the uh, the counter to that. Yeah. Okay, so we use that in like a lot of traditional card games. I didn't realize yeah, yeah. that there was a and name. And that's what it for. is. Yeah, it's card game. There you go. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when did you uh, when did you guys open your doors? When, when did you start? Uh, it was about it was January of last year. Uh, we were open maybe a week in December, just uh, the pre holidays to get a feel for it and. You know, see what it would be like to work the place, and then January was sort of our official getting out there. And uh, we were, of course, scheduled to open April of the year before, so 2020, and uh, and got a bit bogged down with the uh, the pandemic stuff. So we made it pretty clear, especially since uh, at the time specifically. Um, no one knew how touch worked with the pandemic and that sort of thing and, and how long it stayed on surfaces. Right. It was very up in the air. Um, so we wanted to be as safe as possible and not create a place where it could have been a breeding ground for uh, outbreaks, right? So uh, we, we kept doors closed up until, um, uh, well, December was when we started really trying to do anything. Yeah. You know. Jeez, so you were it scheduled to open in April during... COVID. Yes. And then you put it off till January of 2021. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we had, we at first were just following the standard mandates um, that were coming out. And uh, our classification was a little weird. Uh, we pretty much just fell under bar with no food. And during that time is when we started trying to figure out how we beef up our food menu in case we needed that as an excuse to get around those mandates, which uh, not get around, but comply with. If, if the idea is you needed to be a restaurant to have 50% capacity, we were aiming to do that. But um, what we kept finding is a uh, shared item like pool tables, for instance. Uh, you'd have a restaurant that was uh, in Western North Carolina, or North Carolina, was allowed to um, open up their establishment um, for food and drink, and with the 50% capacity and that spacing, but uh, patrons weren't allowed to use the pool tables, uh, for mm-hmm. instance. And we kind of felt our board games fell under that. Uh, but. There was no specific call out like, oh, in board game cafes, here's where you fall in all of this. So uh, we we're just trying to interpret as best as possible and be as safe as possible at the time. And um, 
Uh, that was that's important to us. Yeah. And how do you feel about um, coming out of that, the opening and the momentum and because I mean y'all are you know fighting really hard. I mean you're surviving. Oh, are, yeah. you're, you're, you're doing the thing. So it was it was rough. Um, there was of course the year of paying rent, no revenue, that sort of thing. We had some other issues during the time, like uh, um, we had some flooding from the upstairs unit that ended up uh, setting us back. Um, and some other avenues we were trying to take, such as uh, opening up to private parties, which uh, we had something like four scheduled, uh, like right after we put out the announcement of like eight plus people parties that would just come in. We'd get a feeling of uh, working the place. They'd get to have our beer, which we had already ordered, right? And uh, so um, I, I, it, it has been a struggle, yeah. And. Uh, uh, it, but at the same time, I mean, it's a, it is a bit month to month, but we, we have definitely seen an impact have, uh, through the past year, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, if we're looking at growth, it's about um, double what we were experiencing right after opening. So uh, not bad a year in, and uh, not that that initial, you know, a few months was all that great or anything, but at least it's easy to look back and say, yes, we're definitely uh, moving forward, right? Um, now you have brought up momentum. Uh, certainly a negative of holding off your opening ends up being um, uh, the loss of that momentum. So we had reached out to newspapers. Some had just reached out to us that we weren't even aware of. And we had uh, had some articles published in some magazines, newspapers, that sort of thing, and had a following that was growing uh, that sort of just stopped at that point. And we got, we ended up when we did eventually opening it was just sort of a sort of a poof sort of thing and and uh with a lot of the feedback so far it's um oh we thought you guys didn't make it through covid and uh or uh we just didn't know you were here and were actually able to open so uh a lot of it has been trying to get that back and get the word back out there like ah we survived it's still here feel free to come out sort of thing yeah so I see a lot like on on Facebook or social media in general for where we are. Um, something that um, older folks wish Hendersonville had was outside of the pinball museum, a place for like younger generations to like meet up and hang out. And I know you're a bar, but you also do have like a, a pretty, you know, it, you're you're not like a like a pub. Like there's no, just, there's yeah. just a bar here, but. You do have like a, a pretty like huge crowd of like high school age kids yeah, and everything. Yeah, and and it was important to us. To, uh, in fact, that was part of the reason we wanted to open in Henderson in the first place. Um, it was riskier than other locations we had picked out for sure, uh, given the demographics. But it also felt like it was a place we'd actually be able to bring something new that people might not have known existed. Uh, uh, bring a certain. Uh, a newer activity that people would be able to engage in that they might have been lacking before. Because, yeah, uh, Hendersonville, uh, especially on Main Street, can end up in a sort of... A runaway dice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, sort of end up in um, uh, that, well, it, it, I'm going to go out, and I got restaurants, and I got bars, and, uh, and a pinball museum. And it's which like, man... Happened. Yeah, yeah. Which it, is it's it's still fresh. It's still yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so do we, you get a lot of feedback of people saying, like, we're so excited that we have another option? Because oh, yeah. that's how I feel. And in fact, I mean, we get it almost daily. Uh, you had mentioned high school kids. Uh, we have a crowd that seems to come in every day after school um, and just uses it as that after school space. And uh, we really aren't busy at the time. And uh, so it's, it's really not... Um, it, it's not a bother if things are getting ordered at that time or anything like that because uh, it's just a cool hangout spot and kind of what I would have wanted in high school because the only thing, uh, I, I don't know, I didn't have a lot of nerd outlets when I was in, uh, yeah, going through it. It was sort of just after school, try to get some kids together and then you're staying at school or something like yeah. that. And, uh, and so we're very happy to open that up to them and at the same time, uh, We've tried to have some outreach there too. So we did have uh, youth groups that were coming in during uh, some of our days off. We'd open it up to them. Uh, they, they, we charge a certain amount per hour just for Jan and I to be here. And uh, 
um, yeah, we stick around and uh, just post them doing some games. They'd usually bring through about uh, 20 to 30 kids or something like that, and we made it um, just a monthly thing for them. And uh, what else? There's a Presbyterian uh, church up here with a school attached to it that we also had some outreach to, and uh, just started to give some gift cards to give them uh, just a heads up, like here's something for you. And, uh, that that. Um, and even the ambiance itself was all designed with that in mind, to be a bit brighter, a bit more open than a, a standard bar might be, and that's why I'm usually hesitant to straight up call it a bar, um, because uh, we very much do want uh, a very diverse crowd, uh, because that's who board games appeal to. Yeah, I was going to say, minus the... Uh the folding tables that every card shop has. You go, and that, it's always folding yes. tables, you know, but uh, it, it does have a similar vibe to right, like a comic yeah. book or a card shop. And that is kind of what we were going for. Um, in fact, uh, I was very emphatic, and the tables, since you brought them up, were one of the things I went back and forth on the most because I wanted really, really nice tables. You're talking like. Uh, as far as the nerd stuff goes, I definitely want it to be in a place where, uh, or and provide a place where people have really nice just feel to it. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, take that standard friendly game, sh- uh, game shop, friendly neighborhood game shop feel and uh, kind of escalate it a little bit uh, to where you can really feel comfortable and uh, it could apply to other people too. How's it going? Are you doing all right? Yeah, I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. <laughs> figured out what I'm going to call this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I think just that piece about being like a, a place for there to be a sense of community for kids who need a place to go after school, like just that in and of itself is Yeah, and, and even so important. the adult side of things, the idea was uh, to provide a bit more a place for more social engagement. Uh, yeah. A lot of the times, um, I don't know. I, I and and it could. It's very anecdotal, right? But uh, uh, I find in groups at bars with TVs and loud music, uh, things like that, uh, certainly has its place. But it can definitely detract from the ability to really communicate with people. Absolutely. Uh, and there's nothing there truly bringing everyone together that right. people are centered around and talking about specifically. So yeah, we wanted to to give groups in general uh that sort of uh outlet yeah yeah Yeah, there's in hendersonville you know we i feel like we've got a bunch of the bases covered except for like adult entertainment club as far as alcohol is concerned you know we've got pubs and we've got uh that's gonna come sunday nights yeah we're we're just gonna (laughs) clear out these lights we're good to go Um, but we got like you know family oriented breweries uh, uh, we, we, we don't have a dedicated music venue but now we we also we have an all ages you know like truly all ages because there's alcohol here for adults and if this was a situation where a couple of kids were meeting up and playing and there was even a chaperone situation then you know parents yeah. could hang out here too and, yeah, and the absolutely. vibe appeals to both too which I feel like was probably <laughs> A tricky needle to thread. It, it is, yeah, and uh, the design portion of it definitely had a lot of thought. For it, yeah, you can uh, tell you did great. Keeping it, keeping it a place that someone just looking to hop in and grab a drink would be able to sit down and have a drink and really feel like they aren't out of place, like they might at a a game shop or something like mm-hmm. that. But at the same time, giving enough of that feel that uh, I don't know. That it, like you said, it still applies a little bit. Of course, I'm not a board game substitute. So, yeah. Yeah. so, will you plug your hours real quick? Oh, yeah. So, we are uh, Tuesday through Thursday, uh, 3 to 9. And then uh, Friday and Saturday, 3 to 10. And then on Sunday, we're 12 to 6. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Kurt, thank you so much for your time. Certainly. Um, can I have another one of these sake things? Oh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> I recommend that spriggan. Uh, okay, that'll be next. But I'm very biased towards herbal type things. Well, you yeah. twist my arm. I ain't, yeah. <laughs> it was Those very nice talks to you. Gina, real quick. Before we keep going, have you seen Real Jam Production stuff? It's our local videography company right here in Hendersonville. I have, and they are awesome. The way they tell a story is awesome, and they really capture the essence of what's going on, you know? Yeah, 
And it's not like an advertisement. It's a story that connects and resonates. You know, when I go to places and buy things, it's mostly because I vibe with the mission. If it's a shitty owner who takes advantage of their customers or sees us or their employees as a commodity, then I'm out. And I want to know who I'm supporting and know that they have a genuinely honest and authentic vibe before I give them my money. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Amy and Jay at Real Jam Productions, you can definitely feel that with them. If I was a business owner or had a project that I needed to get across to the public, I would go with Real Jam. And that's spelled out R-E-E-L Jam Productions for folks at home. Real, like old school, love the play on words there. Stay real, love your story, check out realjamproductions.com and get 20% off your next video project by emailing them that you heard about them here on the podcast. This is the part of the episode where we shamelessly leverage our millennial identities in order to bring some levity to the podcast in a segment that we call, What's the T9 Word? Bird. This week's T9 word is E-L-I-5, or explain like I'm five. Gina Baxter. (laughs) Rafael Morales. Interestingly enough, there was a lot that was being uh, talked about during this primary. Um, One thing that we haven't discussed is this this phenomenon uh, that I heard uh, a bunch of independent and unaffiliated voters were, uh, because they can in the state of North Carolina, pull Republican tickets uh, to intentionally disrupt the Republican primary. Um, Can you ELI-5 or explain to me like I'm five, what the hell is that all about? So I have a lot of friends who did this. The idea is that if we can subvert the Republican ticket, we can angle for their, we could have angled for their primary nominee to be someone who was considered unelectable or who was less likely to win than our Democratic primary nominee. Okay. Well, that would make sense if the majority of the people voting in the Republican primary were doing the same thing, right? Exactly. Yes. So it has to be a strategy that's used by a majority of people in order for it to be effective, which it... uh, Well, I was going to say it obviously wasn't, but... I actually, and I, I cringe to say it, know some people who pulled, an, an, who pulled an unaffiliated ticket to vote for Chuck Edwards right? so that Cawthorn would not get the nomination. So the two of us have talked about this separately mm-hmm. without being recorded, um, to our knowledge anyway. <laughs> Looking at you, FBI, I know what you're doing. <laughs> We're on to you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bush. Um, but- <laughs> thanks, Obama. <laughs> We, we agree on a lot of things, but there's some nuance in this particular instance where I believe that we have somewhat of a disagreement, or as I would call, a fundamental <laughs> disagreement in which I am succinctly, diametrically opposed <laughs> to where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So while I didn't do this, because it's a little bit outside of my personal ethics, I do understand having the mentality, especially as a Democrat in a deep or what has been a deeply red state for a long time. I understand the mentality of the disruptor, right? I understand by any means necessary changing the course of what's going to happen in the future because we cannot stand for another term of Madison Cawthorn or anybody else who's going to put us through what Madison did. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that the idea was to come from the outside and to use the political leverage that we have, which is really minimal in our state. I think it's fair to say, I mean, we had to fight to just get legal districts. So I understand wanting to level the playing field, right? Which is is what I think the angle ultimately is to kind of get down in the dirt and play the way that the Republicans would play, because that is absolutely without a doubt what they would do if they had the opportunity okay well this is the part where we disagree (laughs) because i don't think republicans are dumb um and this is in my opinion ignorant as hell um i think that this is super uninformed and i think it's in terrible moral faith i think that it's a perversion of democracy to vote against something or someone instead of for someone who you believe represents you and I think that normalizing that behavior sets a democratic precedent um, that sort of like perpetuates this downward spiral that we find a republic presently in. 
And they think that Republicans vote for people that they believe. I don't think. I know that Republicans vote for people they believe will represent them. And they are very passionate and empowered uh, and proud of the votes that they cast. This chess game doesn't work unless all of the unaffiliated independent people do it. Yes. And even then, I think it is fundamentally wrong. I think that you need to be... Imagine the power if they had all voted for the uh, Democrat and if they had also convinced uh, other people to turn out and to vote for the Democrat. If all the independent and unaffiliated voters actually voted for the person that they believed held their interests instead of... You know, this is this is your... This is your protest vote. You know, this is your Green Party ticket vote. This is your... Um, Oh my God! What was his fit? The, the libertarian Gary Johnson. This is I was your. I going to say Ralph Nader. <laughs> <laughs> we all know who we mean. The third party vote. God, you remember the what is Aleppo? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I do. So this is your protest vote, and th- at the end of the day, I think that um, I think it's wrong, and I especially think that it's uh, democratically perverse for a Democratic candidate, previous Democratic candidate. Um, Mo Davis talking to you specifically, who, you know, swore an oath to protect democracy and to defend it. And that oath does not expire. And he openly endorsed a Democratic candidate and a Republican candidate and asked independent voters to pull a Republican ticket to vote for the Republican candidate. This is disgusting. And and, and normalizing this behavior is going to cause us serious problems in the long term. I I hear you about the ethics. I also think that there's a little bit of privilege in insisting that people respect the system that's broken and that has not worked for them. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it makes sense to me that when you've been torn down over and over again, that you would try to find a different way to fight. And I, I don't agree with it. Sure. But I definitely understand it. I definitely get feeling so frustrated and feeling like your vote doesn't matter and it hasn't mattered and it's not going to matter. And that we live in a state that is so deeply fucked, even with the new districts. Right. I mean, and and the truth of it is that people don't understand what's changed with the redistricting either. So we haven't had a full term to look at the effects of the redistricting. So we don't know what the potential is for our state to go purple. You and I see that there's a chance that we'll go purple kind of permanently. I mean, I, I think that we'll be purple going into the future. I think we're only getting bluer and bluer. Yeah. But if we keep casting these votes, we're misconstruing data points, which I think is a another big issue and another reason that I didn't do it. But I don't, um, I certainly don't hold it against people or think that it's um, inappropriate to not know what to do with your frustration. Right. I agree with that for sure. This goes back to our pilot, our interrupts. Right. Where we brought up that civility is a privilege. Well, that's all the time that we have today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to support us, you can donate to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash fire on the mountain POD. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. Feel good? Felt great. Okay.